Welcome to the Rose Show podcast. Thank you everyone for joining us. Today I'm here with an amazing woman pioneer in trading, Michelle Mish Schneider. She was one of the first author of Plant Your Money Tree, <laughs> amazing book. So Mitch, how are you doing today? I'm doing great. And oh, and I had such the pleasure to meet you personally when I was back in New York. So uh, I'm not only did I have so much fun with you that day, but I'm really honored to be back with you today on your podcast. So proud of all the things that you've accomplished over the last year. Thank you so much. The pleasure is all mine. It was so wonderful to meet you in person in November in New York. Thank you so much for being here today. So let's get started. I think that, well, you're an excellent technical analyst. You're excellent at macro. You're great at everything. And I admire <laughs> you so much. I think we'll start with the pink elephant in the room. Commodities, commodities, commodities. What are your thoughts lately in 2023? Well, certainly having started out in life, in trading, in commodities, watching them really go through a very long cycle of being in a downtrend with you know, spikes here and there, like in 2011 and then pre after COVID. The fact is, is that it was pretty obvious when we got to a point of a ratio at a hundred year low between equities and commodities, that commodities were due. The interesting thing was that most people weren't paying attention to that at all. And here we are talking at the beginning of April 2023, and now everyone is talking commodities. People I've never heard even mention the word commodities are talking. So it just goes to prove that it is really good to be a student of historical cycles and when they get so stretched that they're going to change. And even not so historical cycles, really even more, more shorter term cycles, if you will. And so that gets us back to commodities. So in 2019, it was obvious that things were going to change. As we got into 2022, with interest rates going up, it had a huge impact, obviously, on energy mostly. Uh, and gold and silver reacted up and down, up and down. But there was one area that was really holding steady besides some of the industrial metals, but we were also seeing it in food. And so we've been talking a lot about the fact that there was going to be a new super cycle of commodities coming as we were getting into 2023. And when I was asked, and I wrote this Outlook 2023 call, How to Grow Your Wealth in 2023, I said my top pick was gold, right? And mainly not just because of a commodity, but also because gold would react to what we're seeing right now, which is pretty chaotic conditions. And I like to say whether the chaotic conditions are the Federal Reserve losing control, the threat of the dollar not being the world's reserve currency, OPEC plus really kind of saying the hell with you and we're going to cut production, the the fiasco that's going on with Trump and our own politics right now. I say, you know, chaos, insert headline, will lead to higher gold. And clearly that's what we're seeing. So now what does that mean in a chaotic situation? This is why you have to look cyclically. Energy prices, which people said were the was the worst place to be this year, are now starting to pick up. Food has just stayed elevated. We still have supply chain. And of course, we do have this sort of access of Interesting, I won't say evil, but certainly between the, the Middle East and Russia and, and China, we have situations where they may be taking advantage somewhat of the fact that we seem a bit rudderless yeah. here in the United States right now. And so that's going to only be better for commodities. And we compared it to the 70s, of course, when we started this, because we had no other point of comparison. But I think we're in a completely different type of situation right now. Um, and so it could get even dicier with a Fed that has a has a, an impossible Herculean task to control the economy from spiraling into a recession versus inflation going out of control. So I'd say we haven't really seen anything yet. 
Perfectly said. Thank you so much for all of that. The commodity super cycle, and you've spoken about that. I love your free ebook. Um, the, it's a year of the rabbit. You have a cute little rabbit on the cover <laughs> of that. And I think you've made some excellent calls so far this year. Very impressive, Mish. And um, you were there, I remember a long time ago, I think early last year, you were calling for gold and silver. And here we are, I think gold's about 2000 right now. And do you think that gold, and I think silver is outperforming gold right now. Do you think that this is um, the dips on it, on gold and, and silver may be the place to look for this year? Well, yes, the fact that silver is outperforming gold is always been a, a sign of inflation on the rise. Um, the fact right now is silver is trading about $25 an ounce. Gold is actually trading over $2,030 an ounce. You have to wonder, and this is something that always makes me nervous. I was thrilled to be buying gold at $1,500 and $1,600 an ounce, and I was thrilled to buy silver at $17 to $19 uh, an ounce. Am I so thrilled to keep saying, keep going, pump, 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 pump at these levels when it becomes so mainstream, I wouldn't necessarily say we can't go higher. I still think we can see 26, 2,800, maybe wow. even 3,000 in the gold. That was my prediction. Mm -hmm. I think we can see 30 to $35 an ounce in silver, certainly. But of course, it's always going to be about risk reward at this point. Mm -hmm. So this is really where I start to look at the things that have been ignored um, and, and, and not necessarily be the one saying what everybody else is saying right now. Oh, gold, 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 gold. It could go up more. Absolutely. But I like to be sort of the pioneer, mm -hmm. like you mentioned in the very Ahead beginning, of, of pointing people to something that's happening that other people aren't seeing yet. So now obviously OPEC made the announcements and now pe more people are looking at, at oil. Mm -hmm. And so I think that gives an opportunity, obviously in energy and tech Coal would be another one. Tech resources had this big dive and now that, that tech opened up 17% and higher as we started the week and is getting follow through. I think that brings into question some of the oil services. Will they go higher? Mm -hmm. So looking at OIH, some of the energy stocks. But now, and food still, I mean, sugar, you know, mm -hmm. I'm all about sugar, right? Yeah, sugar I was going to mention been my, Yeah, right. It's been my one constant barometer this entire mm -hmm. two years uh it started out at five cents a pound when before covid it's now at 22 and change wow. cents mm -hmm. a pound that's i mean think about that's sick and yet people still don't talk about sugar so i think you have to look at the implications of what that means for food prices so even though mm -hmm. corn and wheat and soybeans have lifted from their recent uh dip I still think we're looking at DBA. Mm -hmm. They've not really gotten started yet. It, it's been up and down over 20 so many times, and now it's over in this different environment. And interestingly enough, if the Fed is going to pause, and considering we've had some dismal economic stats this week, if they do pause, an area I haven't looked at since the beginning of 2022 has utilities. Mm -hmm. And I started to look at utilities over the last couple of days. We got long Dominion, uh, but you know, even Exelon and some of the classic utility stocks or XLU mm -hmm. could be interesting as A, a value play, B, they're very interest rate sensitive. So as an undervalued play, obviously a necessity, we all need our utilities. Um, and also the expression in my book is when Uncle Hugh shows up at the door drunk, it's time to pay attention. <laughs> so it could mean that these high flying tech stocks, which we have loved, by the way, our quant models got us in a lot of that and a lot of the metals as well. It could mean that they start to peak a little bit in this euphoria and we start to see more value type things take uh, take hold and pricing power in terms of things that could continue to go up, even if. Uh, we start to see elevated energy and food prices again. So that's kind of where, you know, it's, 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 mm -hmm. it's, 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 I, I look at the market right now as like a Picasso cubist period painting, right? We have periods that are inexpensive. 
expansion. I mean, our sectors that are in expansion, sectors that are in contraction, and sectors that are stagnating. So when expansion has been tech, can that sustain? Expansion has been metals. Will that sustain? Contraction, clearly financials have been the mm -hmm. big area. And energy, but that's already shifting. And then in stagnation is pretty much everywhere else. Mm -hmm. Transportation, uh, retail, uh, even, even real estate. Um, so has actually biotechnology, although medical devices in, in that whole area might be coming back. So you got to look at each one of these things now and, um, and make sure you have some hedges on. Absolutely. Well, you definitely stay ahead of the market and that's where you need to be. Um, great points that you make. And USO is one to watch. Um, and then the DBA, the, even the fertilizers, you know, the real assets, you know, we're in a stagflationary environment. Um, and, you know, I look towards inelastic, uh, excellent point utilities. We all need utilities uh, to, you know, to survive, to heat our homes and to cool in the summertime. Uh, so excellent, excellent points there. Um, oh, think, um, and one other thing, by the way, mm -hmm. since we're talking staples here, yes, I, you know, I'm a big into consumer instinct, right? So especially, mm -hmm. I mean, all people, men and women, but certainly women have a really good feel for this. So I was talking to my sister on the phone this morning and she said she went to Target yesterday and it was packed. Now, clearly we're right before an Easter holiday, a mm -hmm. Passover holiday. Um, and so you have people going in for that. But she said it was beyond what she would have expected even a few days before mm -hmm. a major holiday. And I think that's also, I mean, people are taking their money and they're buying cheaper goods and they're mm -hmm. buying um, things that they need, right? And Value. if they're getting gifts, mm -hmm. they're not going to high-end stores to buy gifts mm -hmm. to fill the Easter baskets. They're getting, you know, cheaper things. And that makes makes me, and there's one other thing I want to make sure I mention because mm -hmm. I have my trades every year. For two years in a row was Greece, but now Greece has made its move. So I'm, mm -hmm. I'm not even watching that anymore. Now it's Vietnam, VNM, ah. the ETF. Mm -hmm. And I want to point it out because they are huge manufacturing. Also, I've been reading that Silicon Valley has been sending some of their tech people to Vietnam because obviously if you can't deal with China, because we're in our sort of Cold War-ish period with China right now, What's the next best thing that has cheap goods, high populace, and a really big worth at work mm -hmm. ethic, and that's Vietnam. Mm -hmm. So keep an eye on that. That's my sleeper trade. So I just wanted to add that because Very I haven't heard cool. anybody really talking about that yet. So excellent. You Thank you so much. We got Vietnam. It's diversification across asset classes as well as emerging countries across the world. So uh, great. Thank you so much for that. You know, I think that with the international talk, let's go over to the dollar. What are okay. your thoughts on what the dollar has been doing lately? It's hovering around 101 right now. What do you think? Well, clearly, that's another one. Now, it's very controversial because for 10 years, they've been talking about BRICS and the threat of the U.S. Mm -hmm. dollar as the world's reserve currency yeah, global reserve being currency. replaced by the Chinese mm -hmm. yuan, right? Now, here we are at a new stage where after 10 years of buzz, we're starting to see more and more headlines, again, becoming more and more mainstream mm -hmm. in terms of the notion of that happening. And this is really where I find comfort in the charts, right? Mm -hmm. So I've been looking at the euro versus the US dollar, and, and it's been really trading between 107 and 109, Right. And people thought that the dollar was going to go par with the euro. But now mm -hmm. what's happening is the euro is starting to overtake the dollar. Mm -hmm. And 109 has been an interesting area for the euro dollar area. If we get through there and if the dollar continues to drop under 101, we may see some rallies. But I think what it really means is and what we really don't want to see is that if countries can take advantage of us vis-a-vis -vis through the dollar and, and, and pricing goods in other currencies so that our goods become unattractive, even to Europe in essence. Um, I, I, I shudder to think about what that means for our country. So mm -hmm. at this point, I call the dollar's decline and now I'm kind of hoping <laughs> that it doesn't go down. Yeah, much right. Further because we're Americans. We don't really mm -hmm. want to see that happen. 
So I would say, let's look at the psychological 100, 101 level. And if it holds, maybe things won't be as bad. And if it breaks, then, you know, like I said, buy as many commodities as you can. Mm -hmm. And also, obviously, diversify into some of the emerging markets. Uh, and again, maybe some of the more value plays in this country, but be very careful in terms of really being overinvested in equities. Absolutely. Yes, excellent points. Yeah, there is a concern about the US dollar remaining the global reserve currency. A um, lot of discussion against the yuan as well as the euro. And they're saying that the dollar is holding, but it doesn't look so great in itself. And so we'll have to watch and see. Well, speaking of currencies, what are your thoughts on the cryptocurrencies? Bitcoin, it has broken away from the pack and it's holding around 28, 29,000. What are you thinking about that? Is that something that you're interested in? Well, we have a whole sector of market gauge, which is devoted mm. to cryptocurrencies called Crypto Pulse. Wow. And Holden Milstein, who is young and brilliant, uh, and our team created a uh, algorithmic, a quant for cryptocurrency. So we are actually put our clients based on those signals, the trend strength indicator signals into Bitcoin and Ethereum. So if you're just looking at it from trend strength and our models, it seems that it looks obvious to me that they could go higher. And actually, as we're looking at the market with a sea of red today, Bitcoin and Ethereum are green. Um, Bitcoin, I always say, is an adolescent, doesn't still really know what it wants to be when it grows up. These are these to the U.S. economy, right? So right now, what it's showing is it's feeling a little bit cheerful about the rates potentially on pause, possibly pivot. It's looking more and more like a hedge against inflation and attractive if the currency, particularly the dollar, continues to go south. And it really reflects the lack of credibility that a lot of people fear about government and central banks mm -hmm. in this country and abroad. So right now, to me, it seems like all systems go. We get through 30,000 in Bitcoin and we'll see where it goes from there. Exactly. I've been thinking the same myself. Um, it's definitely showing its strength lately, especially amidst the banking crisis. So agree. Um, what about TLT? I saw you tweeting quite a bit about it. It seems to have gained some momentum and strength. Um, are you looking over there as well? Absolutely. We are actually in another one of our quant models, what we call alpha rotation, which takes advantage of the of the of the macro, uh, has been long the TLTs or the mm -hmm. long bonds, which tells me. Uh, I, I, you know, we've been looking at it for a while, but when, once again, those trend strength indicators come in. And that, by the way, also buys on phase changes. And so once that cross over the 50-day moving average is now is crossing over the 200-day moving average, it has its own implications, right? I mean, some people like Michael Gayed would say, we are going to crash and we're going into a deep recession and we're having a safety back to bonds, which we haven't seen in since the beginning of 2020 before COVID, right? That's possible. The other possibility is you have to watch here how SPY versus the TLTs do. And right now, TLTs are up, SPYs are down, but they're still underperforming the SPY. So it could be just more of a reaction to the recent economic statistics. But I do think that you have to watch it very carefully, because if it starts to overtake the SPY, that would certainly make the case for utilities again going back there, would make the case for some of the emerging markets, would probably make the case for commodities. Um, and it would also mean some trouble ahead in terms of recessionary fears for the economy and for the overall market. Great. Thank you for that. I think we can talk a little bit more about macro, one of my favorite topics. Um, you touched upon the persistently elevated inflation. We have a rising core inflation month over month still. I know it's decelerated, but it's still rising month over month. And, um, you know, we have low growth. And now GDP just came in. They lowered estimates, I think, from 3.6 to like 1.7 or something like that. Um, right. We know that the jolts came in today a little weaker. Um, what are your thoughts going into this year? Do you think stagflation is uh, most likely outcome here? I, I still believe so. But even we're such a label conscious 
society. And so everybody wants to say recession or inflation or stagflation or whatever, even myself included. And then again, I, I tend to go, whoa, when you start to hear it more mainstream. Okay, so that means everybody's fitting or trying to fit into this neat little box mm -hmm. of stagflation. And going back to my Picasso period of cubism, it's like that for me for stagflation. That doesn't mean that we can't have areas of expansion and it's possible that mm -hmm. AI and tech will be one of those expansionary uh, areas that even if we do go down or stagnate, mm -hmm. will continue to go up because of its own fumes. It's, I mean, not only is obviously a lot of retail investment interest in that, but there's some real practical interest in the fact that everybody now uh, looks around their home and says, oh, you know, I, I use computer chips and I like meta because I'm on Facebook or I think there'll be a, a place for the metaverse or I like NVIDIA because they're big creator of chips or, you know, or Amazon because I still shop there. You know, I think that that can continue to expand or maybe not. I mean, it's hard to say at this point, interest rates will be a big factor. And like I said, there'll be periods that are really in contraction, which kind of bodes in the face of stagflation as a contradiction, right? Because look at the financials, right? Banks got killed today, again, at least in the regional banks, and that can have trickle effect. So I think what I'm saying is you can't be so stringent in terms of your definition. So yes, if I had a pick, I'd say stagflation. But even look at the jobs market, you mentioned jolts before Rosanna. So the jolts, there's two ways to look at on thing, or you could look at it, there's less job openings because people are cutting back in terms of how much they're hiring. And that's not good for the economy. So um, yeah, stagflation has a labor implication. And we don't know exactly yet what's going to happen with the overall jobs market. So there's a, I, I, that's why I say you have to look at it like Picasso, like what's here in expansion, what's here in stagnation, and what's here in contraction, and invest accordingly. Great points. Uh, I think the only certainty this year and going forward is uncertainty, and you have <laughs> to stay nimble. And there's always a bull market somewhere, as you said, and you've been making excellent calls and staying ahead of the market. Uh, agree with you on that. I think that you know history rhymes, and even though we may be in a stagflationary environment, you know, and people always go back to the 70s and 80s. I think it, this time is different and there will be different industries. Like you said, AI, um, I think that there's a lot of places to look for investments and for alpha. So um, excellent points there. But I, I can't help it. As humans, we like to label things. We like to put things and simplify them in a little box. But the world is filled with a dynamic moving parts that are always moving and always changing. So, which makes everything exciting and the markets are certainly exciting as we're learning every day. Um, you know, um, the banking crisis recently, they um, they went and they, you know, they the spread the swaps market had that now the Fed will be cutting rates this year when before it was, we aren't cutting and the, all this different noise. I think you can agree that the Fed has a delicate balance right now. Um, they have to reduce the money supply. They need to raise these rates, but these banking issues could, you know, we could have further issues there. What are your thoughts on the Fed this year? You think they proceed with the restrictive monetary policy or you think they let up and go back to some, you know, loosening? Well, I love the way you say delicately balanced because that's a very delicate way, I think, to refer to what the Fed is or is not doing. They, they screwed up so badly already. I, you know, I always think little old me, I don't have a PhD in economics. Um, I'm just, you know, a trader, basically. You're amazing. Um, you're oh, amazing. Come on. You're one I of mean, the best. I mean, you know, I think about the people who work for the Federal Reserve. You would expect that if little old me can figure out that there's these ratios at historical lows that producers haven't really been producing commodities in the way that they had before because price was so cheap. And that's the whole idea 
you have the futures market, right? That, that, that all these things, if you put them together, that there were threats to the dollar, you know, all just everything. The fact that they didn't figure that I figured it out, along with many others, by the way, not just me, before well before they did, is shocking in and of itself. So they already have egg on their face. And I think at this point, especially when you watched Fed uh, the Fed last meeting, when you watched Jerome Powell mm -hmm. on the presser, he looked confused. <laughs> and and, <laughs> and I, I actually feel sorry for him, I do. Um, but what will they do from here? Well, Canada and Australia were the first two countries to go from raise, raise, raise to pause. So Canada being our neighbor to the north, um, and obviously understanding that they didn't want to see their economies go into a deep recession. By the way, can Canadian banking system is much better than we are. They've those that banking institution has been stable for years, and some of those banking stocks in Canada are worth looking at, just as an aside. But be that as it may, if we take or if Powell takes the clue the, the same path, then at the next meeting, I don't rule out a quarter percent more. Um, but it's also possible that he say, listen, you know, he was all into that dot plot thing, right? So mm -hmm. a lot is going to do Friday. We have jobs number. If the jobs number comes in a little bit weaker than what's expected, he may say this is a good time to take a pause. If it comes in stronger, he may go a quarter percent. And I think that's kind of how he is. And the whole Fed is, as I've said before, reactive, not proactive. Had they been proactive, we wouldn't be having this conversation that we're having right now about everything that's going on. Excellent. We appreciate your valuable input. Even though you say you're little you, I think you're pretty <laughs> amazing. And Mish, your calls and your macro analysis has been tops, I have to say. So a uh, very impressive um, record that you have with everything. Thank you, Rosanna. Before we go into your thoughts of the equity markets, I want to bring up this amazing book. OK, you wrote this book, Plant Your Money Tree, and it's been said to be the best wealth book of all time. OK, I am in economics. I love economics. And the way you talk about the cycles and you break everything down, you are a true teacher. OK, you're an amazing teacher, Mish. And the way you make it easy for everyone to understand, everyone needs to get this book. OK. Amazing. I love it. And it's pretty too. I love the colors. I love it's green. <laughs> um, but you mentioned in this book, very important points. And one of them is the modern economic family. And you talk about these six key members, which are actually sectors. So I want you to please introduce these family members to all of us and explain their significance in the market. Well, first of all, thank you so much on commenting about the book. It's it's funny because I was thumbing through it today, um, looking about that, looking for the quote on utilities. And as I'm look, looking through it, I realize that the book really covers from 2008 to 2016. So in terms of the headlines versus the technical setups, it seems a little outdated. But there are evergreen. Most of the book is evergreen in terms of the phases and the cycles. Mm -hmm. It's classic. And finding, you know, one man's trash is another man's treasure. And as you've just brought up the economic modern family, and if I have one goal that I would love to accomplish, it's to get a second book going mm -hmm. more on the economic modern family, because the longer I live with them, the more I realize that, um, I don't know where this all invented in my head, but it invented in my head and it's been amazing. And here's a classic example, and we'll go through them in a, in a moment, but regional banks. Four weeks ago, the regional banks, when the market was still rocketing into March, regional banks started to break down under its 50 week moving average. And in the book, I like to use the weekly moving averages because I think we've gotten a little too um, much into the daily and the minute and the five minute. And there's so many people with the ODTE crowd and everything else just looking so like, uh, so I like to step back and I've always liked to step back. And KRE four weeks ago was breaking the 50 week while everything else was doing pretty good. So again, could I have ever predicted what would happen with the banks and Silvergate? No. But 
Modern Family Character Regional Banks was going warning, 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 enough for me to feel like I should start writing about this warning, and I did. I talked about retail and I talked about regional banks. So that means that another sector, and they change, took control. And they all have their turns. Retail right now is still weak. And certainly compared to semiconductors, another sector of the modern family. So when you start to see one, my sister semiconductors, and I like to call her Wonder Woman with her ability to fly, versus her little old granny retail who's <laughs> limping around the mall, still at the mall, but limping. And then you get re re prodigal son regional banks collapsing and then transportation kind of stuck in the middle and biotechnology stuck in the middle and grandpa Russell kind of like also stuck in the middle. You have to say, what is the family telling you? And the family is telling you exactly back to that Picasso Cubist painting period is that we've got this disjointed, period in the economy, tough to trade, tough to predict. But at the same time, when you have a family so disparate, it means that it will resolve one way or another. Is regional banks going to continue to fall? We almost got back down to the March lows today, um, April 4th. Or is semiconductors going to pull everything up? And that's why the modern family is so important. Bitcoin, cryptocurrency is also part of the family as well. And obviously that's doing better along with the semiconductor space. So, I mean, it, 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 in some ways it's clarity and in some ways it creates a little bit more head scratching. Like what, what do we do now? I love it. I love how he humanize these sectors and how they all work together. And it all makes a lot of sense. I love that. I love using that as a gauge for what's going on in the market. As we see the semiconductors has been strong, has been doing great for quite some time now in quarter one. Um, we'll see if, like you said, if it can pull up the rest of the growth stocks um, and uh, it's exciting times ahead. Um, now let's talk about the four indexes. You had a great article on marketgauge.com um, with IWM, SPY, QQQ, and DIA, and you compare them. I love that you used a 23 month. I think that's so smart, taking that bird's eye view and looking at it, like you said, moving away and not being so into the daily and watching so closely. And you notice some interesting things that only the DIA was close to being at near the 23 month. Is that correct? What did you see in that analysis? So I've always used a 23 month and an 80 month moving average, but never in all the years that I have been trading, seen it play out as importantly as it's been playing out this year. And if it's 23 months, people ask me why not 24 months, it's just a matter of the smoothing on the moving averages, but basically two year cycle makes more sense this year, right? Because 2021 was really super bullish, 2022 was super bearish, 2023 is kind of like the WTF. Ah, right? We don't know. So I've been watching these 23-month moving averages and indices very carefully because in 2022, um, you had actually NASDAQ break down below it first, then the diamonds followed, then it was the Russells, and then it was the SPY. So they all eventually broke the 23-month, which showed you that we were going to go into a period from what we saw in 2021 into a much more contractionary period like we saw in 2022. So now this year, all they've all done is gone and rallied right up, right up. I mean, if you don't love technical analysis after this year, <laughs> you should, because I, I almost couldn't believe my eyes. That's why I did the four chart view in that particular daily. So Dow, and the industrials and the manufacturing, which of course includes a lot of defense stocks, right? You know, so General Electric and Boeing and then Intel's in there with a the chip stock got right up to the 23 month. The Qs are the next strongest right up to the 23 month, which makes sense, right? Because of Apple and some of the growth stocks, right? But IWM is way down and SPY is closer to the top, but not quite there. None of them have taken out that 23 month. So the reason why I think it's so fascinating is if we really are going to see 
the worst is behind us and we're going to go into an expansionary period. We got to at least see one of them clear. And I, my bet would be the diamonds would clear first, but they have it. If NASDAQ clears, that would be good. And if we follow the 22, 2022 pattern when they all broke down, one goes, the other one goes, and then the other one go, oh, okay, all right, I guess we're growing. If they don't get through it, that's information. It means all we did in a sort of euphoric state about the Fed and realizing that the Fed can't save us is rally to resistance. And if we start to move down from here, you'll see me start writing a lot more about the 80 month, which is a much bigger business cycle of more like six to seven years, which so far all of them have been holding on to. I agree. Even the you. weaker sectors. Yeah. yeah. Excellent. Thank you so much. I agree with you that the technicals are key and the patterns are amazing. Um, and uh, I think that's a lesson for all. Now let's talk about fundamentals. What are your thoughts on an earnings recession? A lot of talk about that. It seems imminent. And we have compressed margins. We have higher costs of debt and capital. I mean, the risk-free rate is at the highest it's been since I think 2008. And it's higher than the earnings yield of SPX and NASDAQ. Um, you know, and uh, what, so what are your thoughts with that side? Let's put aside the technicals and let's look at the fundamentals. What are your thoughts with all that? Well, clearly we've seen a lot of layoffs, right? That's been dominating the headlines as well. And the expectation for this coming earnings season is not great. And, and, and everything you just said, all the reasons why. I, 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 I like earnings seasons, but I also discount a lot of it because how often have we seen whatever the expectation is, if it is better than the expectation, we'll see that stock or that company rally. And if it's worse than the expectation, we'll see it fall only for people to come in and start buying things that are cheap. So I think it's from a fundamental standpoint, it's great for the number crunchers and I'm not a number cruncher, but you know, they really sit there and think about the PE ratios and, 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 and all of and the EPS and how it relates. And to me, it's really going to be a matter of how far beyond or below the expectations we see in terms of this recession, as you're talking about a earnings recession and what the forecasting is going forward. So if it's going to be somewhat of a disaster, first of all, my modern family will tell me, and right now they're not really saying, except for KRE, by the way, is broken down under that 80 month moving average I was talking about, because we can see that in terms of the banks, that's already in a deep recession. So we'll see whether or not the earnings is just going to give us more information about the expectations and then going forward what the narratives are that come out of these companies when they do their talks. And I think it'll be very interesting to see certain companies in particular. What does Elon Musk say about Tesla? And what does Bezos say about Amazon? And what does Cook say about Apple and um, and all of that? So I... I would not I would not put my investment strategies based on earnings. I just think it just gives a lot more information and it's a kind of a fun thing for people to watch. <laughs> exactly. Get your popcorn <laughs> ready. <laughs> Get your popcorn yeah. ready for those earnings. Exactly. Reports. You know, I agree with you. It's all about market reaction and you know the buyers and sellers and supply and demand. And that's why price is the ultimate determinant. And you know, price only price pays, right? Brian Shannon. Um, yes. So, you know, um, I'd like to know what you have done. What what have you changed and adjusted in this market now and what you're doing? I know it's a side, I, I call it a sideways grind, sideways market. It seems like we really haven't gone anywhere. We've been hanging out at this range. What are you doing? What's a really good question, Rosanna, because I have found First of all, I started this year saying that I was going to focus on gold and commodities, and I wasn't going to let all the noise in the equities distract me from my focus. Because people think you have to be in 20, 30, 40 positions in order to make money. And as a commodities trader watching a lot of people make millions and millions of dollars just trading COMEX or trading crude oil, I learned that that's not necessarily the, the, the case. And I listen to traders who say, well, once you buy something, you kind of put it away and just let it grow. Uh, you know, to me, this year was a great uh, reason to compound on those commodities as a way to make money, day trade around them as a way to make money, add to the position, which is the same as compounding to make money. So that was number one that I was focused on coming into this year. Number two, 
was that in terms of equities, from a discretionary standpoint, I wanted to buy things in sectors that I believe in, that I can wrap my mind around that might be in some mega trend that will either continue or is emerging. So obviously AI and tech is a mega trend that's continuing, but what could be emerging and what I've been watching carefully is things like beauty. Uh, Kim Kardashian is one of the sponsors of Cody, C-O-T-Y. Mm. That stock has gone from six to 12. That's a double, right? There aren't too many stocks that you can say have doubled it this year. Um, or I'm looking at live streaming on a global basis basis of sports and music. So you have Roblox, that's more in gaming, but you've had Paramount and Formula One racing. They've been interesting to me. So I get my mind wrapped around these certain areas that most people haven't really looked at yet. Or I may be looking at Vietnam, for example, something in the emerging market. Or I may be looking back at 3D printing because it's kind of a forgotten technology, but it's still a technology. It just hasn't really been seen. The point is, is I'm always looking where mm -hmm. the rest of the crowd may not be looking as a discretionary trader. And the thing that I've been doing is buying equities or stocks in those areas where there's a tradable low so that I can put it away, have my stop under that low and not watch it on a daily basis. And that's worked out really well. I've had some really nice trades. Now, of course, I take profits along the way and I raise my stops, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera. But that's really, if I can see my way to a two to three, even four ATR uh, risk, which means average true range or what the range is on average of that particular instrument, put my stop under there and go, okay, I'll look at it. And, you know, and then, I mean, I look at things every day because I'm kind of a junkie, but you know what I mean. Not worry about it, have no anxiety. That's one way. However, I have a really super advantage as a trader. I have a company that has developed over 10 quant models that have spread everything from, like I said, alpha rotation, global macro, sector rotation, small cap leaders, large cap leaders, NASDAQ all-stars. And so that in an essence has given me ability to watch just the opposite of what I like to do, which is more be the first in line and not necessarily go in the door with the herd. That's a momentum uh, way to trade through these quant models. And the quants have been really interesting for me because it's kept my mind open to the possibilities of just because things are going up and everybody likes them doesn't mean they're going to stop going up, which has probably been one of my biggest weaknesses as a trader in, in, in all the years, unless I'm so convinced like a goal, oh, it's going up, it's just gonna go up mm -hmm. more. That's different, that's commodities. I'm talking about companies. Cause I, I, I'm not a big fan of buy good companies. What does that mean? Companies are cheap. What the hell does that mean? It means nothing to me. But when the momentum indicators and the trend strength indicators based on all these parameters that we have put into them, fire, yes, buy, now I've learned, oh, pay attention because it's seeing things from a mathematical standpoint that I am not necessarily looking at. I love that. Thank you so much for sharing that. That was brilliant. I'm going to have to, you know, go back and listen to that all over again and then just keep listening and taking notes there. That's uh, <laughs> Thank you so much for sharing um, your mindset with us. And that's actually the next question I'm going to is your mindset. You have been trading in the market since the eighties, I believe, right? And that brings yes, you we can we can we can leave it there. But yeah, actually, you know what? That means you have so much wisdom, and your experiences are amazing. And you have learned from mistakes because we all make mistakes. But you keep coming back, and you come back better and stronger. If you could please share with us your mindset and your trading psychology through the years, how it's evolved and how you're using it during these very difficult times of 22, 23. Well, thank you again. Um, well, I'm fortunate because I do seem to have a very clear vision as to what's coming. And I think part of it is just being intuitive naturally. Uh, part of it is genetically, because I come from a long line of Russian gypsies who read coffee grinds and things like that. <laughs> <laughs> and part of it is just looking at mathematical patterns in charts, 
which is geometry and probability and being pretty good at that. So I think what I've learned through the years is when I get away from that, second guess my instinct, um, get into something before it's really had a good setup, don't really understand my risk, get influenced by the crowd. Hey, everybody suffers from FOMO, right? Beat myself up for whatever reason. I mean, right? Psychologically, everybody has reasons to beat themselves up on any given day. That's our monkey brains. Um, what I've learned as I've gotten older is to kind of stick to my wheelhouse, what I'm good at, how I like to trade, learn from other people who are specialists in other things um, and, and, and that I totally respect. And essentially, like I said, just really stick to what you know. And I've been fortunate this year because what I knew was commodities and they've come back into vogue. What I knew was precious metals. They came back into vogue. Uh, what I know is oil and I see it's going to come back into vogue and all the other stuff that I feel instinctually just avoid it if I don't have a clear path to get into it and work with the stuff that's working by, you know, like I said, day trading around it, adding to it um, and, 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 and get rid of all the other fritter that's happening uh everywhere with social media it makes it even worse mm -hmm. so then i also have been much less focused on what everybody's tweeting i i look i browse um but i don't necessarily read as much as i used to in terms of tweets because i think that gets your mind crowded as well wow thank you so much for that i agree with minimizing the noise we have bandwidth constraint so it's important to avoid having too much information at one time. Um, and, you know, knowing yourself is key. And like you said, trusting your instinct, trusting yourself and knowing yourself and at the bottom, at the end of the day, that's the most important, the bottom line, um, you know, and you have expertise based intuitive decision making. It's pattern matching. You've been doing this for a long time and it's deliberate practice. It's you learning this and you're an expert. So your decision-making, most of it is intuitive. It just feels right. It's hard to explain, but it's you pattern matching against recognizable prototypes in your head. So you're actually, it, it's an amazing automatic system one thinking that goes on with people like you. So always love learning from you. You're amazing. I admire you so much. And I think everyone needs to come to marketgage.com and check you and your business out because you have a great team and great products. And I don't even know all these different products. You're in everything. You're like ahead of the curve. And you're like, I didn't know you were in Bitcoin too. Impressive. Uh, so thank you so much, Mish, for taking the time to share your brilliance with us on macro and markets and everything. Could you please tell everyone what Market Gauge offers? Okay, so everything that I just talked about in terms of pattern recognition and looking for things that have reversed off of major lows or have changed phases um, or have found momentum or trend strength indicators, we have so many tools that kind of do that for you so that if you're a uh, a quant trader, obviously, you can take it to the step of just buy one of the quant products. And when it sends a signal, you do it. Obviously, with assets under management, you can say, hey, just give you money and you know you do that. But if you want to be a discretionary trader, but take advantage of all of the technical analysis that we've been able to automate with tools, my favorite product that we have right now is called the Complete Trader because it gives you, and that's our market gauge, it gives you exposure to momentum indicators, leadership indicators. I talked about TLTs outperforming or underperforming SPY. We got something that tells you that, right? Big view, which is our uh, all our breadth indicators. It gives you all of our reversal signals, whether it's a bullish reversal or a bearish reversal, bullish compression continuation, bearish, so that you get a list in these scans every day of these stocks. And it's breaks it down for you. Where are they in momentum? Where are they in phase? What sector are they in? What's, what's their ranking in that sector? How many days have they been above or below the 10-day moving average? What phase they're in? And you could take that and you go, you know what? Based on this, I'd like to look at these three stocks the next day. 
And then, you know, so that's really been one of, I think, one of the most uh, undervalued tools that we have that I've become a big fan of this year because I'm not running my Niches Market Minute premium service anymore. I'm doing coaching in the as part of the Complete mm -hmm. Trader every month. And Jeff Bish, our president, does it every week where we go through that and we teach you how to use these tools, how to decide what stocks to pick, um, look at the sectors, you know, that kind of thing, how to look at the overall macro. And my job at Market Gauge is really to continue to be steeped in not only what to use when, as opposed to what to trade when, that I'll do in my daily blog or in my social media or in my actual media media appearances. So yeah, we kind of we kind of do it all. And and if you need any information on, well, on this kind of trader, what do you recommend? You know, that's kind of what I'm trying to do now for people is educate them on us as opposed to educate them on this stock pick. Perfect. Well, you are an excellent teacher. So I, I am so impressed with everything. I, I want to thank you again for spending the time with us today and sharing everything with us. Thank you so much, Mish. Marketgage.com um, is the place to be for everything. It seems you have everything. So thank you so much. <laughs> thank you to all the listeners. Thank you so much, listeners. And thank you, Roseanne. I love you. I love you too, Mish. You're awesome. <laughs> Rockstar.